welcome to She Thinks, a podcast where you're allowed to think for yourself. I'm your host, Beverly Hallberg, and it's an honor to have Congressman Andy Biggs on today's episode. He's going to answer a few questions on the latest developments with the coronavirus, including Congress's efforts to mitigate the spread of this disease and efforts to support the economy. We're also going to discuss a bill he's introduced called the Freedom for Families Act, which is a free market alternative to federally mandated paid family leave. Before we bring him on, a little bit more about the congressman. Congressman Biggs is an Arizona native and currently serving his second term in the U.S. House of Representatives. He is a retired attorney and has served in the Arizona le- Arizona legislature. He served for 14 years, the last four as the Arizona state president. He's been awarded champion of the taxpayer from Americans for Prosperity. And he has also been honored numerous times by the Goldwater Institute as a friend of liberty. He lives in Gilbert with his wife of 35 years, Cindy. They have six children and five grandchildren. Congressman, a pleasure to have you on today. Great. Great to be with you. I'm happy to be with you. Thank you. And as a time that we're recording this, it is Wednesday evening. There has been so much going on in relation to the coronavirus. I'm curious from your perspective as a representative, you represent um, Arizona. What has it been like to be the representative during such an historic time and a time where we frankly don't quite know what to expect in the upcoming months or weeks? Well, it has been um, very interesting. It has been, quite frankly, like uh, a run on the bank. I don't know if you remember the movie It's a Wonderful Life where George Bailey's going off with Mary on their honeymoon and then they see all this kind of hysteria and panic and they go, he says, looks like a run on the bank and they go back. It has kind of been like that um, and a fire hose of information coming out trying to discern what is accurate, what is inaccurate, um, what we should do that would uh, help restore calm and order and still protect the people of the country, uh, both now and the future, because I mean, we're, we're looking at decisions we're making now. I have a chance it could either, uh, build on the good foundation we had prior to, you know, just three weeks ago, we had this phenomenal economy. Um, and we can build back on that or we can actually tear down the structure of that foundation uh, in the, in the months to come. And it's been very, very interesting. Um, uh, and, and, you know, something I, I don't suppose anybody in this country planned on, on this type of thing happening uh, so quickly. Not at all. And, and one of the questions I have for you, which I don't think there is a definite answer to, but I think what I'm hearing from so many of my friends and family members, we want to know how long we expect life to be different. Um, I think it's going to be different for the foreseeable future, but the extreme we're seeing right now where people are working from home, businesses are shut down. Is this something we're going to have to be in for the long haul to see this type of closures economically? Well, I certainly hope not. Um, look, there's, there are, uh, there's some quick advances. There's, um, so there's some uh, medications that were available during SARS, which, uh, the Chinese have indicated that they seem to provide both a, a pre-coronavirus mitigation and also, well, uh, once people got it, it actually um, slowed the uh, the disease down and, and helped cure people. So that particular medication has, has been uh, phase one tested already, and it's just if we can get that out. So you want to move that stuff to the front and try to move calmness to the front and get some kind of normalcy there because this, this, what you described where people are saying, what's going to happen? Was this a week? Are we going to be like this a week? Are we going to be like this a year? What is this? It's that unknown, which is really driving some of the, uh, uh, the emotion and worry and concern that people have. We've got to try to get our handle on, uh, get a handle on it to, to help, uh, uh, quell that, that fear that people have. Well, the president has been holding daily com- daily press conferences as of late. He called himself a wartime president today. We saw that the Senate did approve a multi-billion dollar emergency aid package on Wednesday. Um, that passed the House as well. But you had concerns. You have concerns with this emergency aid package. What were some of your main concerns, especially since what we're hearing is this is supposed to help people who were forced to go home, whether they needed to take care of their kids who were off of school or they had no job to go to because their job was shut down? Yeah, the way this worked out is um, it, it, you're not 
treating all businesses the same, which is always a bit of a problem. But but leave that aside and move into this and just say what we're doing is there's a segment of society. In fact, it is uh, where the vast majority of our businesses are, and they're going to get crushed because they have to provide uh, the upfront capital to make sure that everybody's getting all of the unpaid leave or the family leave or the medical leave that, that this bill is mandating on them. And their only um, recourse will be um, quarterly tax mitigation through the payroll tax uh, uh, process. And that's a problem. And the other aspect of it, too, is that we were we we were given 12 minutes to read the bill before we voted on it in the wee hours of Saturday morning. It's about a 115 page bill, something in that neighborhood. And the, um, the technical corrections, uh, were longer than that. So that tells you there were some major problems with what they gave us, um, Saturday and they were trying to get them fixed on Monday. I'm not sure they did get them all fixed. And is this something you're concerned about as a whole during this emergency time where things are rushed through because people are desperate for help, that we end up creating more government that's permanent and not just temporary solutions for people? Well, that's that's for sure. I mean, so I always say uh, bad bad process makes for bad policy, and that makes for bad politics. So what we're doing is uh, in that bill, we basically um, expanded uh, at least a half a dozen programs, uh, and they supposedly are to be temporary expansions. But my experience, when you expand a government program, you create a new constituency, you create a new constituency, it's very difficult to ratchet back that program. And this bill, by the way, that just came out, it was this, it's called, they're calling it phase two of the, of the uh, relief packages. Phase two, uh, we have no score. We have no idea how much it's going to cost, but it looks like on the low end, you're going to, you're looking somewhere to two from two to $250 billion and the low end of that package. So we're talking obviously about a lot of money, and I think you hit the nail on the head just a little bit earlier is what does this mean for businesses and employers? So if they are the entity that's supposed to take up the burden for employees who need time off, um, just as, as, as I like to share with people, I'm a small business owner incorporated in D.C., and D.C. automatically takes money out of my small business um, for paid yeah. Yeah. which is the burden um, for my small business that only has three employees. So, um, and none of us have need to, needed to use it as of yet, but yet we have money taken out of my small business for that. You have, th this then brings up a bill that you have introduced prior to us knowing anything about the coronavirus pandemic. And that is an act that you introduced called the Freedom for Families Act, which addresses paid family leave saying, look, we need to make sure that people are covered if they need time off for a wide variety of reasons. I think the question comes down to who pays for it. So you've come up with a solution, a bill for that. Why don't you tell us about your solution to this problem? Yeah, thank you. I mean, uh, what what I saw and, and the reason I think we needed it is because uh, we have uh, people who want to be responsible. Want, they want control of their lives. They want to take care of them. And uh, the HS their, or the health savings accounts were underutilized. They were overly regulated, overly constrained. So we, we said, well, what, what can we do to make this more beneficial to Americans? who might need it for family leave, who might need it when they're adopting a baby or when they have a birth or in situations like we're seeing today, which is exactly what you're talking about with, with, with a coronavirus issue where, you know, if they had a health savings account and they, and they got laid off, this, this bill would kick in. The idea behind it is to provide a very broad uh, use of this money and, and, and incentivize it with uh, tax, uh, make it tax uh, favorable to the to the person who's creating the account. That's what it's all about. And you know, if we had that already in place, I think it would be very helpful for many, um, literally millions of Americans today that have access to health savings health savings accounts. Quite frankly, you could probably expand this to to uh, to give benefits uh, in an emergency like this uh, beyond my bill into IRAs, key accounts, whatever other types of retirement savings people have so they get to access it um, without getting penalized. And that's what we're trying to do. 
And this was a bill you introduced in 2019. So last year, less than a year ago, you you did introduce it. You had a lot of conservative support, but you didn't have many of your liberal colleagues get on board with with this act. What is really the the reason why liberals don't see this as a way to provide people with more choice and more opportunity? Why do they think that it has to come from an employer and that government needs to mandate it? Well, that is the $64 million question because uh, in reality, <laughs> They they do think that government is a better place to do this than 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 the business and the individual. I want to give I want to empower the individuals. I want to empower the businesses to make these choices, um, and they would prefer to keep that power centralized in the government. and And I don't know why that is. I have my suspicions, um, but the reality is, I think we'd be better served. If you, I mean, like talking about uh, the D law that requires you to, uh, where you're losing some some funds directly because of their law, uh, it seems to me you'd be better served um, to work with your employees as as the owner of the company. How can you best uh, satisfy your employees' needs as well as your company's needs instead of letting the government, who quite frankly everybody says, uh, you know, the government feels this way, but it never feels. It is an it's like a couch where it can hurt you. And couches feel, we feel, people feel, and business owners feel, and employees feel, and and they think, and they can rationalize and come together, and and work out these problems far more efficiently and effectively than, in my opinion, big government. Yeah, it came as a complete shock to me where I saw my the payroll company that I use just automatically was taking more money out of our our account <laughs> um, every six months yeah. to pay for this. And I was like, wait, I didn't know this was going to happen. So it came as a shock to me. <laughs> um, so I wonder with, with the coronavirus and what we see this bill going forward, do you think the fact that now paid family leave is part of the discussion again, and it has been, but this definitely brings it to the forefront. Does this give you a huge opportunity to try to push forward the Freedom for Families Act, or because people are looking as government as a solution to this, is this making it harder to have health savings account be the way that people can access funds when they need it? Well, you're, you're right. It's going to make it a little bit harder, but this group of folks that I've been talking with and working with them the last uh, few days, trying to put together alternatives uh, for phase three, that would include stuff like um, uh, this Freedom for Family Act, uh, because we really want to uh, let people have more control over their lives. But what I see happening is two bill, which is one of the opposed, and so many of us did oppose it, is that it actually centralizes power in the federal government and takes it away from individuals. And every time we do that, not only do you create the constituents constituencies, which makes it harder to eliminate those programs or pair them back. But it also kind of sets into place uh, like concrete this notion that you should be going to the federal government to resolve all your problems and all your issues every time. It's really not where we'd like to back over to the American people, uh, divest, divest some of the uh, power and centralization of power that you see in D.C., get it back to the people, get it back to the states, um, and and get the bureaucrats in Washington out of your life and out of the lives of the American people. And just a final question for you, and this is, I realize, a broad question, a bigger question, but since you're talking about the centralized power of government and, and federalism, is it the states, is it the federal government, who should be involved in issues such as paid family leave? I think the question comes up with what is the federal government's role in a situation like coronavirus? I see people debating what the federal government should decide when it comes to what should be closed in certain states and what should be left open. How do you balance the federal side and the state side, and how would you say President Trump is doing on that balance so far? Well, I think President Trump has really tried to get this right, um, and I'm not sure that uh, everybody's tried to get it right. I think President Trump tried to get it right, recognizing that uh, governors and states really have, uh, they're more in tune to what, what's going on. So for instance, in Arizona, where you have maybe a dozen coronavirus cases, um, six of those in one in the same household. I mean, this governor here is going to have a, a better vision of what needs to happen in Arizona 
in say in Washington state that had such a tough time of it or Florida or anywhere else. And so I view it this way. It's real simple in some, some ways and, and maybe more complex than others, but the constitution is pretty clear that power is supposed to be in the rest in the States. If you have interstate commerce, um, and that's where the, where the federal government can come and regulate. So it could regulate, I mean, oddly enough, it could regulate domestic flights or something like that because that's the, those are in interstate commerce. But when you're not in interstate commerce, the intrastate um, issues are meant to be at the, at those state levels. And that's, that's, it's a balance. You're right. It's a tough balance. And so many of my colleagues choose to um, overstep it, but that's, you know what, we're just at probably, uh, we've been 80 years wandering down this pathway where the federal government keeps uh, getting more and more power. And that's one of the concerns I have when it is whenever you have a crisis or a, a big event like this, the federal government takes more power instead of divesting power to the people who are closest. And I think that is a major concern. I appreciate you sharing your thoughts on that. Also coming on to talk about the Freedom for Families Act, again, a free market alternative to federally mandated paid family leave. A really important topic right now as we're talking how to help people due to the coronavirus. Congressman, thank you for your time and do stay safe out there. Thank you very much. Have a great one. And thank you for joining us. I wanted to let you know that if you enjoyed this episode of She Thinks, we'd love it if you left us a rating or a review on iTunes. It does help. And we'd love it if you shared this episode to let your friends know where they can find more She Thinks episodes. From all of us here at Independent Women's Forum, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.